Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Tech Done Different. As always, I'm your host, Ted Harrington. And with me here today is our special guest, Jason Geffner. He is the head of product security for Aurora Innovation. Jason, thanks for joining the show, man. Thanks. Super glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm excited to uh, for, our, for our chat. And when you and I were talking the other day, you got me really excited about this idea. You've, you've had this really interesting uh, exposure or experience in your career where you've, you've experienced product security, application security, both as a security consultant and now in charge of product security in-house. So I want to start by asking about that contrast because not everybody actually gets to have both those experiences. Most people are sort of one or the other. Um, and, and we're going to talk about how I actually believe, and I'll be curious to see if you believe too, the company should actually have both in-house resources and external resources. But if you were to boil it down to the one most striking thing that you notice when you transition from being an external security consultant to now being in charge of product security in-house an organization, what's the biggest thing that you noticed is different? I think the biggest thing, uh, aside from thankfully less travel, <laughs> is uh, <laughs> uh, you know when you're when you're consulting, your job is to find the vulnerabilities and report them, communicate them. Um, but when it comes to fixing them, that's not really your job. Now, ideally, right. you're making recommendations on how you propose that these issues be fixed. But whether they get fixed or not, uh, hopefully they do. But you know, you're gone by the time. The developers typically start to make those fixes. So I think the biggest difference is that when you're on the product security organization, when you effectively are the customer, um, you got to fix the stuff uh, or at least mitigate it based on um, based on the risk severity. So uh, I, I think that's the biggest difference uh, is when you're consulting, you're kind of off the hook when it comes to fixing. But um, when you're on the product security team, uh, you need to make sure that your your highs and criticals really are getting fixed. Got it. So when you think about your your experience as a consultant, right, you would define or your team would define the severity rating of a given vulnerability and uh, based on a number of factors. And now that you are on the other side of the equation, you're receiving those um, is there anything that stands out to you that you feel you were doing right or maybe were doing wrong in terms of how you thought about vulnerabilities and, and the severity of them? Yeah, you know, I think um, very early in my career, and I, this is probably true of many people um, in the application security space, um, our, our viewpoint is always, uh, hey, here's a security bug, it should be fixed. Um, mm -hmm. We don't always take into account uh, the uh, the potential impact or the potential likelihood of it being exploited, uh, nor the cost of mitigating it. Um, whereas when you're on the other side, you do really have to take all those things into account and accept the fact that um, sometimes it makes sense to not fix a security risk that you know about, even if it's a high risk issue based on the likelihood and uh, the impact of exploitation. Uh, sometimes the cost is so high um, that it might actually make more sense to not mitigate, uh, to not completely mitigate the issue. That doesn't mean that there aren't other workarounds you can do depending on the actual issue, you know, sandboxing or uh, reducing attack surface somehow. Um, typically, there are things you could put into place in addition to monitoring to see if it is exploited. Can you at least detect and respond to it? Um, but I think it's a pretty big paradigm shift to go from uh, early on in, in one security career thinking, oh, it's a security issue, it must be fixed, to being responsible for it all and saying, well, it's not always the case. Let's think about what the ROI is on actually mm -hmm. making the fix. Yeah, that's pretty fascinating uh, because I've, yeah, as a consultant, certainly, you know, we run into that issue too, right? Where it's, we see a problem, it's like, you got to fix this. It's, you know, critical or high severity. But we also realize there's business constraints that might prevent it from happening. But I always feel like, and, and tell me what you think about this thought. So I'll state it as a thought and you tell me if you agree or disagree or poke holes in or whatever. But I always feel like the what our job really is, is to empower the customer to be able to now make an informed decision. So even if they, as you were saying, say, I choose not to fix this vulnerability, they're choosing to do that rather than they didn't know the vulnerability exists and they are thus choosing not to fix it because they don't know about it. 
Do you, do you agree or disagree with that? A hundred percent. The job of a security organization or of a, a security um, consultant is really to provide visibility um, and make clear what the, uh, what the trade-offs are um, in terms of uh, what the risk is and what the costs are for, for fixing things. Um, and then usually it's the business owner um, who's the customer, whether that be an internal customer, if you have your own internal pen testing team, um, or um, you know, another customer, if you're a consultant, um, you let that business owner decide um, how they handle the risk that was identified. So uh, I think that, uh, uh, again, that paradigm shift is going from security being all about um, technical things to security being really a lot more about the business and risk management. So uh, it's a very different way of, of thinking, but uh, it's been a fun shift to make uh, throughout the career so far. So in your own personal motivation, why, why did you want to make that shift? Because that is a pretty significant uh, difference. And uh, certainly you lose maybe some of the independence and now maybe you have to deal with some of the politics that might exist within a given organization. I'm not saying that your company does or doesn't have that, but that, you know, you don't have that when you're a consultant. What was motivating you to want to cross that barrier? Um, so I think it's, it's probably a few things. Um, one is that, uh, you know, I, I've had cases where back when I was consulting, uh, I was fortunate enough to work with some, some pretty big customers. Um, and I would find security vulnerabilities during my assessments for them and report them and recommend fixes and whatnot. And then a year later, um, uh, the vulnerability would be publicly exploited and it would be in the news. And I'd be thinking, oh, those, those fools, why didn't they fix this? I told them to fix it. I told them, I warned them. Um, so I thought, well, hey, you know, maybe if I'm on, if I'm on the other side, um, I can have more sway about what gets fixed, how it gets fixed, um, and uh, really protect the user better. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is that um, as I progress through my career, um, I think I wanted to make the shift from uh, independent contributor, whether that is an individual consultant um, or even an IC at, uh, at a, a larger company doing security work, uh, moving towards management because I realized not only could I have more of an impact on the overall, the holistic security of the company, but uh, it's a great feeling to know that you can have an impact on the career trajectory um, of uh, other people in the security space. I think that's a really fulfilling thing to have. So let's talk about that. That's that's interesting. Uh, I, as a leader myself, I find that to be probably the most fulfilling part of the job too, building other leaders and creating opportunities and growing people. Uh, it's often lamented that in security, there's this you know widespread shortage of talent, which I agree to be true in most cases. Um, so I guess there's two questions here. One, is that your experience as well? that there's a shortage of talent. And then the second is how do we, whether there's a shortage or not, how do we get more people into the field? Hmm. I think that when you're a manager, hiring is always the most difficult part of the job. Um, I think there is a lot of talent out there, um, but there's also a lot of competition for that talent. Um, and if you're looking for people who are who not just have the, the technical skill set, uh, but also who are a good cultural fit for your team and your company, it makes it more challenging. And also, if you value things like um, having diversity of experience, diversity of, of thoughts, of backgrounds, um, and recognizing that that can really strengthen your team and your company, um, that actually makes it more challenging challenging because you are further effectively um, putting potential constraints on your search for that talent. Um, So yeah, it's the hardest part of the job, but uh, it is, as you said, very fulfilling when you find those right people and can can bring them on board. Right. So what do we do about this widespread problem? I'm sure you've seen the posts all over LinkedIn of where these, (laughs) the job requirements are absurd, right? It's like entry-level security jobs require a master's or PhD and you know, eight years experience for an entry level job. Why does that exist? And, and what do we do about that problem? Yeah. So no doubt those, those do exist in reality. I think that, you know, we, we see them posted and we laugh about them because they're novel because they're just 
they're not super common, thankfully. Um, I, I think sadly, um, it's often the case that the hiring managers for these roles don't really know what they're looking for or what they should be looking for or expecting. They're a bit out of touch with, with reality when it comes to the security space. Um, but I think most well-respected companies, um, at least well-respected technology companies, um, have a good enough understanding of security from an executive viewpoint or from a middle management standpoint where hopefully their, their uh, you know, job requirements are based somewhere in reality. Um, and you know, as, as terrible as it is when, uh, <laughs> when, when these job descriptions that do expect you know, 15 years of experience in a programming language that was only invented five years ago, uh, right. when those do hit Twitter, um, you know, I think that whatever company posted it does get some blowback and it's a, it's a learning experience for them in that sake. So maybe we just have to keep uh, letting people learn organically through that approach. But uh, I'd say, thankfully, it's, it's, it's rare enough that um, it's not something that I worry about. Got it. So when you, when you look at the kinds of people that you are in the position to, to groom and to grow and cultivate and all that stuff, um, what, is, what is one or more of your principles as a leader that enable you to achieve your leadership goals? Yeah. Um, you're asking me, what do I look for in other people or how do I kind of help them advance in their career? The latter, what do, you, what do you believe as a leader is the thing that you should do in order to groom and grow people? Yeah, I think um, understanding your people and having empathy for them are, are critical. Um, I have, I've managed many people throughout my career and um, no two people were identical to each other. Um, each person, you know, overall, we want a lot of the same things we want. We want to be paid fairly. We want to be treated with respect. Um, so there are always things that are in common, but it's important as a manager to recognize what are the differences? What do people uh, value differently? Um, and being able to uh, deliver on that when appropriate. Um, the other thing is, is understanding what career trajectory they're looking for. Um, some people love being ICs and they want to stay that way their entire career. And I'm fully in support of that. And mm -hmm. it's important that um, you provide opportunities for them to continue to grow in their career um, at your company as an IC, if they choose to do that. Um, the other case is for people who do want to move into management um, and being able to kind of tell them what to expect if they've not done it before, the pros and cons um, and the, the very different uh, kind of work style that, that's involved in that, um, but also kind of helping them ramp up to get to a point where they actually can start managing people. Um, maybe setting them up as a lead in a certain area for the organization, uh, or giving them an intern, um, giving them um, the opportunity to mentor um, a new hire. Uh, I think it gives them all a lot of the hands-on experience that they would get in normal management. Um, and as you see them make mistakes, you kind of helped redirect them and, and advise them. Um, and when you see them doing well, you acknowledge that too and, and congratulate them. And um, hopefully that allows you to more easily move them into a management position when one's available. You made a really interesting comment a moment ago when you, when you described it. I'm going to butcher the way you said it. It was more eloquent than this, but something you were talking about um, understanding that different people value things differently. And the question to you on that is, there's, there's a nuance to the question, but the question is, how do we figure out what people value? But the nuance to the question is, when people, off, especially younger people younger in their career, often don't themselves know how to articulate yet what they value, because maybe they haven't had enough bad experiences or good experiences in order to say, like, I, I need to be led in this way. So how can we uncover that, especially for those younger people who have not, um, you know, don't know how to articulate that? Well, I think one way is just being direct and asking. So mm -hmm. when um, when I have someone new joining my team, um, I straight up ask them, what do you like working on? What do you hate working on? What are you, what do you want to know more about and want exposure to, but you know, I'm not going to assume that you're an expert on it. What do you want to get better at? Um, I think, I think oftentimes 
uh, people wait for others to just tell them what they want. Um, but we're all really busy and a lot of us are can be very passive anyway. In, in this case, it just makes more sense to be direct and flat out ask people. But you're totally right. Not everybody knows what they want. Uh, it's not the case that they, that they know it but don't know how to articulate it, although that can happen too. But a lot of times, like you said, people just don't know or they do know and they change over time. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. Um, earlier in my career, um, my viewpoint was that uh, I want to work with really smart people, but um, you know whether they're really nice or not, eh, it doesn't bother me. I'm trying not to be working closely with them anyway. Uh, I don't mind working with jerks. Um, but you know, I've had uh, enough experiences over the years with, with one or two places where I've worked, uh, where I've had to work with jerks, and it's the worst. It makes your, <laughs> your entire life bad, not just your work day, but you're thinking up you know, in the middle of the night, how do I deal with this really tough person? Um, and I realized that one of my key requirements for working is working with nice people, mm -hmm. um, ideally working with nice, smart, hardworking people. Um, but something that I learned about myself that, um, that I didn't know before, how important it is to work with nice people it makes a, a world of difference. Yeah, it's really amazing. It, it seems like this um, being nice and being kind almost seem like these nice to haves or extras. And, and what you're saying, which I totally agree with, or I believe what you're saying is that, no, those are core requirements of a you know, high performance team, right? They are for me. And, you know, as a, I was saying a moment ago that the hardest part of, of being a manager is, is hiring people, finding the right people. Um, it is so frustrating and just crushing when you, you, you look for amazing people and you bring them on board and you, in, not, not on board for hiring, but you interview them, they go through the full loop and they just, they kill it at every, sec, uh, every single technical question. They crush it, they know the exact right answer, they blow you away. Uh, and then the more you talk with them during the interview loop, you realize, oh, this person's kind of a jerk or yeah. not necessarily a jerk, but they'd be a really bad cultural fit just based on their attitude or their, mm. their their viewpoints, how they handle things, um, and having to turn away people who you know are technically brilliant because you know that they would introduce toxicity into your your into your team. Um, it it sucks. It's it's, it's terrible. But um, as a manager, it's a decision that that's super important because um, I'd rather have someone who is super kind and super eager to learn and super passionate and hardworking um, and train them up to be really technically gifted. Um, then bring on someone who's already a technical genius, but it's just a jerk to everybody and makes half the team leave. I love it. Kindness first. Yeah. Uh, that's so, that's so, such a cool insight. And I think so many people think that in such a technical and scientific and complex field as security, that the first requirement should be those technical skills. Uh, but what you're saying, which I definitely agree with is, or I'm hearing you say is that um, those can oftentimes be taught and in a lot of roles they can be taught. So yeah, that's, that's really, really powerful stuff. And what you're describing too, tell me, tell me if this is a challenge you see as well. Um, the, the same scenario you described is even harder if that person does get hired. And now they're this great performer technically, they, they contribute but they are oil in water, you know, and they're rub everybody the wrong way. And then you have to terminate eventually a high performer. That sucks, right? Yeah, um, it does. I mean, there are things you can do. I mean, having just honest, open conversations with them in private saying, hey, I saw how you handled this. Uh, you ended up upsetting this person. Here's a, a better way to approach it in the future. Uh, and there are good you know, trainings like that, that exist as well for executive function <laughs> or communication um, that really make people realize that, uh, that you know, maybe they're not handling things interpersonally the best way possible. Um, and, you know, I actually, I'm of course not perfect myself. It's an area that I've worked to develop as well over the years. Um, I took uh, an executive education class several years back where um, uh, one of the things that they talked about was that, um, be careful of how you e word even your questions because there's such a concept as toxic questions. So, so many of us would think, well, 
how can I be offensive? I'm just I'm just asking questions. I'm just mm-hmm. you know curious. I want to I want to know the answers to these things. Um, but depending on how you phrase it, you could really upset people and come off as a massive jerk just based on how you word your question. Um, just you know implied uh, assumptions in the question uh, or uh, accusation kind of built into the question. Um, so I think learning things like that and being able to choose your words more carefully, both in writing and you know, verbally, um, I think it all can be learned. But unfortunately, it's it's if it is learned, it's often learned through the process of making mistakes um, and realizing mm-hmm. after the fact, ah, crap, shouldn't have said it like that. Yep. Um, but you're right. If it doesn't, if it if it's not learned over the the right course of time, then yeah, it does typically have to end up in in germination. Gotcha. So let me pivot a little bit and let's go back to the, uh, some questions around how we actually secure products. So um, in previous steps in your career, you had mentioned uh, in a previous conversation I had about how you were involved with managing third-party risk. Uh, I would love to explore the, the problems and the opportunities around this. So I guess really the first question is, um, what have you seen historically be the biggest challenge for uh, companies? And you worked for, for some pretty large ones over, over the years. What have been some of the biggest challenges for how you actually deal with, you've got this huge collection of companies that you work with. You, won't, you need to understand their security posture in order to work with them. You need to have some sort of process to actually vet their security and then make a business decision about whether to work with them. What's the number one problem with that whole uh, conundrum? Yeah. I think, I think the biggest problem once a company reaches a certain size is managing the sheer quantity of vendors that the company works with. Um, and vendors span so many different areas. There is, um, you know, vendors providing thick client software. There's vendors providing SaaS services. There's vendors providing contractors who might come into the office and get an actual email account and, and you know domain account. Um, there are vendors who provide freeware or open source software. Um, are those vendors? Are they not? Well, they're providing third party things that we didn't create at our company. Mm-hmm. Is there a risk involved there? So um, I think for a, a small a very small company or a small startup, um, you know, a spreadsheet might work fine um, for the first year or so. But once you get big enough and you realize, uh, oh, I'm dealing with thousands and thousands of vendors, um, you really need to uh, move to something that's designed to handle more than a spreadsheet can in this sake, uh, in this context. Um, so whether it's creating your own platform for um, triaging, uh, you know, vendor requests and, and managing uh, how much you trust them, uh, or using a third-party platform, which thankfully exists now, mm-hmm. for um, for managing vendors and communicating with them. Um, I think that's that's really a requirement. Yeah, it's fascinating you mention uh, spreadsheets because uh, we've seen even in some of the largest companies on earth. A lot of them are using spreadsheets and emails to manage this whole thing, right? The whole process, the auditor emails in something or the vendor emails in their security report. And then someone from the security team has to download it, enter it into a thing. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with you on the need for a platform. So, um, so managing the, sh- the sheer scope is one problem. Um, what about the actual logic around making the business decisions? How is that communicated uh, internally in organizations, and I'm not asking for specifics, like at this company, this is how we did it, but uh, what are the problems that you typically see in terms of, you know, the business unit, they're chomping at the bit to say, we want to use this product. The, the security team is saying, oh, hold on, hold on. I need to get all the information in the right place. Legal has their own requirements, procurements, you know, breathing down everyone's neck. How does all that internal communication get resolved? And what are some of the big problems in resolving it? Yeah, I think there are, are several inputs into that type of decision. There's um, what is the sensitivity of the data or the systems that the vendor will have direct or indirect access to? Um, it, it, oftentimes it's the case where, hey, the vendor is only handling things that effectively are already um, 
public knowledge already. That mm. Nothing sensitive that they're really touching or getting access to. So, you know, they probably don't even need to go through a security assessment, which is the ideal case. So mm. trying to triage things and, and front load them um, as much as possible to not even have to worry about them and put them through their process is fantastic. Um, but that's one input is, is what are they actually getting access to? Um, second input is um, what is the vendor's security posture? Um, that's where most of the work comes in for these security reviews is, is trying to assess that, um, basing it on um, typically questions, high level questions that you ask them and that they answer, um, then providing you with um, you know, uh, audit compliance certifications, things like that. Um, ideally them providing you with penetration test reports if they have them um, and making a judgment call based on all that with regards to the posture of the company um, and the security of um, the systems with which you will be integrating, um, if mm -hmm. that is the case for how the vendor is being used. Um, and then the other inputs are things like, okay, we, we either trust the vendor enough that we can uh, move forward with them, no questions asked, uh, or Ooh, we do have some concerns. You know, it looks like um, according to this pen test report that they were kind enough to share with us and their transparency. It looks like, uh, you know, they had a dozen SQL injection vulnerabilities that were uncovered three months ago and it took them two months to remediate them. It's 2021. That really shouldn't be happening these days. So mm -hmm. we're real we're concerned. Um, and you're right. A lot of times the business uh, side will come back and say, well, they're the best in class vendor for the product or service that we need, we still want to use them. So then it comes down to uh, trying to determine uh, how can you best put up mitigations to minimize the risk of working with the vendor. Um, and uh, in addition to what we discussed earlier about um, communicating what the risk is in a way that the business can understand. Um, you know, some people on the business side do understand what SQL injection is and that's awesome. But the truth is that a lot of them don't, and that's okay mm. because well, they know a lot of things that I don't know about business. And that's fine. Um, sure. So uh, being able to say, listen, here's the risk. Here's the worst case scenario. Here's how likely these things are to happen. Uh, if you're okay with that, then that's a decision that that you can make. But I, I don't want you as, as a business owner or business leader to make a decision of going with this vendor without understanding all the risks that pertain to the the data or systems that you own. Mm. And then yeah, we're to, to implement those mitigations. Sorry, go ahead. Right. No, sorry, I didn't mean to step on you. It's a, it's it's calling back to something that you were talking about before, right? The same idea of the job the security team's job is to empower the business to make decisions. And then those decisions can be, well, we're fine with this risk. We'll just accept it. I love it. All right. Well, as we uh, as we wrap up here, is there on, on either on any of the topics we talked about today on leadership, on uh, third party risk management, on what it means being an external security consultant? Is there any last parting wisdom that well, we haven't talked about that you want to leave our audience with? Um, I would say. My parting wisdom is. Um, as a security professional, um, recognize that your job is to um, discover, minimize, and communicate risk. Uh, your job is never to make, uh, provide perfect security. Um, you will drive yourself and your colleagues crazy if that is your goal, to have zero security vulnerabilities. Um, and it's important that the people you work with understand that your mission is not to provide perfect security, it's to minimize risk and communicate it. Um, I think knowing that it allows you to sleep a lot better at night. Yeah, oh, I love it. Yeah, it's it's progress, not perfection. What a what a good note to end on and uh, totally, totally agreed. So Jason, thank you so much for joining the show today. I learned a lot from you. Hopefully our audience will as well. And uh, yeah, thanks for all your time today. Thanks, Ted, it was a pleasure. Absolutely. And everyone else, if you want to learn more about the show or request to appear yourself, just head over to tedharrington.com backslash podcast, and we will catch you next time. Thanks. Mm -hmm.